Well, today I've got this Sony audio video receiver. It's a seven channel uh, amplifier, Dolby Digital, model STRDG720. And the problem that we're having with this one today is when we go ahead and power the unit up, we get a nice display. Everything appears to be working normally. And then we get flashing protect. So where do you even start troubleshooting something like this? It's pretty basic. There's not a lot to these receivers. They're pretty streamlined this day and age. The older uh, Dolby Digital, the first ones, there was quite a bit going on in there. You could have some digital problems, which I have had. If you've seen my video on the, uh, I think it was on the Onkyo and the Denon. But uh, let's talk about where to start on this one. Well, one of the first things that we can start with is taking a look at the voltages on these emitter resistors. These are low value resistors. There's two resistors in one package. Typically they're anywhere between about 0.2 ohms, so two tenths of an ohm, to uh, almost one ohm per side. Uh, this one, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, there's wire in the way here, but it's actually labeled 0.22 ohm plus 0.22 ohm. And most of these are rated at five watts. So one of the first things that we can do is take an ohm meter and we can measure across the two pins and see if we can indeed read close to half an ohm on this one. So I've got my ohm meter here and I'm just going to do a couple of them just to show you because I don't think you can see every single one. So we're reading about 0.4 ohms from the center lead to the left hand lead. We'll take center to the right about 0.4 then I should see about 0.6 or 7. And that's taking into account lead resistance on some of these meters. You may get a 2 or 3 tenths of an ohm actually as you short the pins together, or as you short your leads together, you may see uh, half an ohm, an ohm, depending on the meter. This one I, I see 2 tenths of an ohm, so I have to add 2 tenths of an ohm to every measurement that I make on here. So 0.4 minus 2 tenths approximately is about 0.2 ohms. So well, that's good. So just go down, check every emitter resistor. This is a seven channel amplifier, which means you'll find seven emitter resistors. Uh, each emitter resistor is connected to two of the output transistors. It takes two transistors to drive one speaker. So you'll see if, if you look on this one, there's 14 transistors on the heat sink back here. Now be careful when the unit's on and plugged in these two big filter capacitors right here, they're kind of hard to see with the back panel on. These are pretty good sized capacitors. These are 10,000 microfarads at 71 volts each. One's on what they call the B plus line, which is the positive voltage line. One's on the B minus line, which is the negative voltage line. So typically we'll see on an amplifier like this, anywhere from about 50 to 65 volts positive and negative so you could see between the two potentials uh, up to 130 volts and 10,000 microfarads is a lot of energy if you were to slip and have an accident uh, it would definitely uh, blow the lead off your meter or put a big chip in it it's a lot of stored energy so once you've gone through and you've checked all the emitter resistors and you made a determination that none of those are actually bad uh, you can go on to step two. Now, if you have found an emitter resistor that is open, you can almost be guaranteed that you've got a shorted output transistor. And the way to, to solve that or to determine that problem is to, let's get our voltmeter. Hopefully you can see it here. We'll put it on the diode range. Each transistor has three leads, and I'm looking at the front of the transistors right now. The left-hand lead is the base, the center lead is the collector, and the right-hand lead is the emitter, which the emitter resistor connects to. So what you'll want to do is just get a voltmeter, and it's going to be hard to see because I'm going to have to have my hand kind of in the way here, is we want to check from collector to emitter. And I'm just looking for shorts. I just want to make sure I don't see a dead short between these transistors, collector to emitter. And everything looks good. That's just an example. I've tested those two. I've actually gone through and tested all these transistors, and I'm pretty sure I've determined the fault of this amplifier. But the next thing I want to do 
is I'm going to put my voltmeter back on the volt range. I'm going to get my negative lead with my trusty little jumper that I use. And I'm just going to clip this onto chassis ground. I'm just going to use a video jack back here. Hopefully you can see that one on the camera. I just stick it in there. That's my chassis ground to confirm. I'm going to put my ohm meter on ohms. And I'm going to touch it to the ground. I want to make sure I see close to zero ohms when I do that. And I do. So I'm pretty happy with that. Next I'm going to go ahead and fire the unit up. And I'm just going to check the center lead of every output or emitter resistor. And just see what I come up with. And what I'm looking for is one that reads higher. Uh, we should see about zero volts. There's one that reads 58 volts. Which is telling me that I've definitely got a problem here on this what I would call the sixth out of seven channels. So transistors 11 and 12 are both having a problem. Next with the unit off, make sure that it's unplugged. Let's put the meter back in the diode range. So the next thing I'm going to do is I just want to check collector emitter. That's a dead short on the diode range. Oops, I'm on the wrong one. That one's a short. That one's a short. So at this point we want to go ahead and disassemble the unit and pull those transistors out of circuit and test them out of circuit and see if we still get the same results. Now if you've worked on Sony audio products for any length of time, the older units, they used to actually put on the bottom, there would be a cutaway held in with some screws that you could remove to gain access very easily. On the new units, they're not like that. The only way to gain access to this unit is the complete back panel is going to have to come off of the unit. All the jacks and everything, you'll have to take all these screws out screws here in between the speaker connectors all the way around the back panel it's got to come off all the boards have got to come off and then the whole main board has to be disassembled and taken out of the unit okay i've got the complete back panel loose except for one screw that i missed It'll be taken out the power cord just has a squeeze lock plug on it. Just disconnect that. Next we'll have to get rid of all these circuit boards that are in the way now. Most of them have plugs. They can all be disconnected. A lot of them will just hang. Uh, some have the tie downs that go around the other boards. They're pretty logically assembled which means you really can't get them plugged into the wrong places even if you tried. Sony's been very good about that for years by using different connectors. Certain connectors are only a certain length they won't reach otherwise. Uh, a lot of these boards actually, let's see if this one unplugs. Oh, it's got one more screw. Sometimes you'll find a secret hidden screw on the side. Once you get those boards out of the way, then there's screws that hold the heat sink in place. Plus there's normally other screws in the circuit board. This one's got one back up in here, plus the ones that hold the heat sink, so I'll take those out next. All right, I've got the whole board up and ready to work on it. It was these last two transistors. Uh, Sony actually labels them so you can take a look. Like this one is labeled SL minus VE, SL plus VE. So this is the negative voltage amplifier for the surround left channel. Positive voltage amplifier for the surround left channel. This is the surround right channel, negative. Surround right channel, positive. Front left. 
This one's labeled uh, subwoofer slash SB slash I can't quite make it out. But most of them are all labeled depending on the setup. Surround back left, surround back or subwoofer. Uh, front right, center, and surround back right. One thing about these Sony receivers, it's very evident by the color of the circuit board that they run very hot, particularly the driver IC packs. This one has four of them. Each IC drives two channels. So they're using two, 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 and one in most cases. Uh, but typically because of the heat, they develop little rings around the solder connection. So it's always a good idea to go through and resolder all of the pins on the driver packs the driver ICs, but you can definitely see the discoloration here. They, they run them way too hot. When those things are running, you can't put your finger on them. They're so hot. So let's go ahead and uh, remove the two transistors in question. Now in some cases, they're kind of hard to get to. You gotta kind of work your way in here to get to the screws. So I'm going to try to move them off of the heat sink just a little bit to make it easier to grab onto once I get them unsoldered. And I've had people say, well, what if you don't have a fancy solder sucker? How do you get these parts out of the circuit? Well, I've leaned them forward just a little bit and I'm going to try to, if I can get it angled at just the right, hopefully you can still see it here. Uh, the leads on most cases, you can push them, just heat them up and push them back a little bit and then you can pull the transistor right out of the circuit quite easily. The nice thing about some of these, they leave you a little bit of extra room back here. So I've got them out of the circuit. I've got my voltmeter on the diode scale. I just want to double check that they check shorted out of circuit. They do. It looks like the uh, base to emitter junction is good, or base to collector junction is good on both of them. Because I see a diode on both of them. So it only shorted the collector emitter junction. So let's take a look and see if there's a possibility of any other parts that could be bad before we put new transistors in. So now here's a partial little schematic of what we're dealing with. And I did find a couple of uh, 100 ohm resistors one that was completely open and the other one that had drifted out of value it was 105 ohms so I'm going to go ahead and replace those at the same time I change the output transistors and then we should be ready to go provided that there's no damage to one of the driver IC chips so we'll just have to take that one step at a time I'm going to go ahead and replace the transistors and replace the resistors and hope for the best at this point And one thing I forgot to mention was uh, make sure you check the emitter resistor uh, before you go any further. That side checks good. Check each side individually. The center lead is common. That side is definitely bad. It reads uh, 10,000 ohms. And so uh, we definitely got a bad emitter resistor. So I'm going to go ahead and take that out and replace it as well. And so I'll do this one without uh, using the solder sucker. So. Uh, I just added a little bit of solder to the emitter resistor and we want to just heat up a couple of the pins until we can get it to pull out, rock it back and forth. And then if you don't have any uh, wick or anything, just take a dental pick. As it's stainless steel, the solder won't stick to it. Go ahead and heat up the pads, poke the pick through there, and then that'll clear out the... the uh, Clear out the solder so you can insert the new part in there. So here's our uh, old emitter resistor. We'll have to get another one of those, which I just happen to have, luckily. So I've got my new uh, output transistor. I've got my new emitter resistor. Let's do a couple quick uh, ohmmeter diode checks on the transistors. So here's how your transistors should check. The new ones on an ohmmeter. This is going to be from base to collector. We should see a junction there. And then from base to emitter. We should see a junction. We should see nothing from collector to emitter. 
but we should see a diode if we reverse bias it. And now this is the PNP because it's an MP. Now on the NPN transistor, it's just the opposite. So if we start with our negative lead on the base, we should see nothing on collector or emitter. But if we start with our positive lead on the base and we go to the collector, we should see a diode junction. And if we go to the emitter, we should see a diode junction. Same thing should hold true, but opposite. We should see a diode in the reverse direction from collector to emitter as well. So all those check good. Uh, let's go ahead and install them now. Make sure on these that you apply ample heat sink solution to the back of them. They need to make good contact. They do dissipate quite a bit of heat. So I like to put them on there and make sure that the backs of both of them are covered very well, especially the metal parts. That's where all the heat transfer is done. Uh, make sure you get them in the right order when they go back in. If you get them reversed, you will definitely have problems. The good news is all these are in order, so you can just find what sequence that they're in. And on this one, particularly, the, the uh, PNP is on the right-hand side. The NPN is on the left-hand side. So let's see if we can get a couple screws into it. And on this one, you got kind of push through the middle of the two filter capacitors to gain access to it. Not too tight, just nice and snug. You should see heat sink compound oozing out around the outsides of the transistors when you get it tight. There we go. Go ahead and replace the emitter resistor. Now we'll go ahead and we'll solder it in and we'll give it a try. Just make sure you get them soldered in place well. I like to use a little extra solder. It uh, structurally improves the contact because these things do heat up and cool down quite a bit and you'll see typically a little bit of thermal expansion and contraction over time and we don't want any damage because of that. There we go, just take a good look over the work, make sure there's no solder bridges, and we should be ready to go. Remember, like I said before, you may wanna take a look up here where the drivers are, and you may wanna go through and retouch all the solder connections on the drivers, which is what I'm gonna do right now. Okay, so I got the new transistors in there. Uh, make sure on these units that you get the back panel on because a lot of these use the back panel as a ground plane, so if you try to run it with the back panel off and the screws out of the jacks, uh, you'll get uh, erroneous readings. So there's the power button. We should get a relay click a few seconds later, which means that the safety circuit is checked out and there's no DC offset. There we go. So I wanted to show you, I've got my meter on the millivolt range over here, and uh, we can check the idling current of another channel. It's about 4 millivolts across 0.22 ohms. This one's going to be much harder to check just because it's my transistor doesn't come out the top or my emitter resistor doesn't have the leads out the top but we've got about 4 millivolts there and 4 millivolts there. So that looks good. That's what we want to see is about 4 millivolts of idling current on the uh, emitter resistor. Now there's no adjustment on this model to actually adjust the idling current. Some of the other mo models have a little bias potentiometer and that sets up uh, the transistors to make sure that they're in the right class of operation. Okay, here we go. Go ahead and power the unit up from the front. Make sure it comes up and stays out of the protect mode. That's good. And we're working. We've got audio out of it now. So hopefully uh, this will help somebody get their little Sony audio Dolby digital receiver repaired. Once again, uh, with your help, we can keep these things out of the landfill and out of the recycle bin. I appreciate your views, your comments, your support. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter at NorCal715. Everybody have a great day. Take it easy. Bye-bye.